People around the world visit a Lolo ranch without leaving their homes. If one of us have left a gate open accidentally, uh, it takes about five minutes and we hear about it. Observe the process as ice forms on a Montana river. It's a neat part of our rivers. It's an important part of our rivers. A group of retirees makes a Seely Lake campground a great place to pitch your tent. We got good friends around. It's time for something big for our 50th episode. Backroads of Montana is made possible with production support from the Greater Montana Foundation, encouraging communication on issues, trends, and values of importance to Montanans. The Big Sky Film Grant and the University of Montana. Home is where Montana is, Montana is my home. From mountain peaks to prairie lands, the places I have known. And I'm bound to ramble, yes, I'm bound to roam. And when I'm in off the road now, boys, Montana is my home. Hello, and welcome to the 50th episode of Backroads of Montana. I'm William Marcus. Over the years, we've traveled from Ekalaka to Eureka and Westby to Wisdom to meet some of Montana's most interesting people and to share some special places you might like to visit. This antler pile is a sign that we're at the National Bison Range outside Moise, a place of natural beauty that helped restore one of America's most iconic animals. We'll explore the Bison Range and learn its complex history throughout the show. Our first story takes us back to the very first place we photographed on Backroads in 1990, Giant Springs State Park near Great Falls. To get underwater footage, we had to place our camera in a large aquarium. Now, after all those years, we thought we'd return to this tranquil little park nestled beside the Missouri River. Only this time, we'll let someone else get wet. Officially, it's a state park, but Great Falls would like to think of it as their own. Great Falls definitely loves this park. You know, Giant Springs has been a major part of this town, so, so the locals are here all the time. <laughs> It's where they come to stretch two or four legs, or just stretch out, to plunge into a pool or a picnic basket, to take a leisurely stroll and daydream as they watch the trout slowly swim in a circle. And when something goes wrong at their favorite getaway, they get mad, darn mad, because Giant Springs is their special place, reserved for the special moments in their lives. Simply put, it's where Great Falls comes to relax and enjoy the perks of being a Montanan. As a result, Giant Springs State Park is easily the most visited state park in Montana, with close to half a million visitors a year. But all that love requires more than a little attention. For the small staff we have here, it's, it's a lot of work to, to stay on top of the maintenance and, and, all the, and all the visitors. Part of that maintenance includes the springs. Twice each year, the Electric City Dive Club shows up to clean up litter and clear out some of the unchecked vegetation. After a quick safety talk. As you dive, you know all the precautions. Dive safely and enjoy. Dive Club President Jim Benner assigns the first duty of the afternoon. Try to recover a lost wedding ring. I think it's over there and she's gonna point it out where, where she lost it. He saddles Ann with the task. Ann will be the diver looking for it. Okay. Point out the exact spot that you dropped it. While Anne literally searches for a needle in a haystack, the rest of the club settle into their various duties. Max was actually diving. Uh, Dave was actually diving. Carrie and Cheryl were working the edges, throwing what they could over the edge so it would go down the river. Jim maintains a safety position above water, keeping a watchful eye on everyone else. Anything we do has got a certain amount of danger. You can spot the trouble. Yeah, even I'm fully dressed, I'll go in the water and help. Within minutes, Anne surfaces with something in her hand. It's a cell phone that's been in 12 feet of water for two days. Remarkably, it still works. And in less than 20 minutes, the owner arrives to happily collect it. The club returns to the day's cleanup, removing any invasive species, but also carefully thinning out some of the native vegetation which can overpopulate the springs, obscuring the bottom and choking out the fish. 
The park's many regulars like to keep track of what's going on down there. There's, there's a number of them. My staff and I were talking about how you could write a book about the, the regulars down here. We have a, a guy that comes down um, almost every day with his ducks and he walks his four ducks down from the parking lot and they swim in the springs. It's an awesome, awesome park here. Faith and Grace are my two older ducks and then this spring in March I got uh, two ducks I named them Arnold and Betty after my great aunt and uncle but um, Arnold turned out to be in Arlene so I got four girls. Um, a lot of folk come here and and uh, really enjoy it. You're probably not helping the interview any there. <laughs> Even Mike's ducks can't experience the springs to the degree that Ann does. The peace and natural beauty of the park is doubled in the uncommonly clear water. It, it's real surreal, I guess is the best word to say. It's, it's just so completely different than anything you'd find on land and the fish kind of follow you around trying to figure out what the heck we're doing down there with them. But, uh, so that's just really fun. Eventually, Anne's supply of air is exhausted and she surfaces. Aside from the cell phone, today's haul includes a couple of fishing lures and some change. That money will be donated to the children, but no ring. There are just some things that the Giant Springs refuses to surrender like a young woman's wedding band, and the love of this Great Falls community. In July of 1896, humorist and writer Mark Twain spent an afternoon at Giant Springs and visited the surrounding area. He described Great Falls as the prettiest little town in the West. Well, in the history of the West, the systemic eradication of the American bison as a tool to move Plains Indians onto reservations is one of America's ugliest stories. As the animal faced extinction, the American Bison Society proposed a refuge to restore them. 19,000 acres of the Flathead Indian Reservation were taken by the government and fenced off. Indians weren't welcome. The reservation had a large bison herd raised by tribal member Michael Pablo, but the U.S. government had no interest in buying them, so Pablo sold most of them off to Canada. The few left behind became the start of the bison range herd. Today, about 300 bison graze here, and after long negotiations, the range has transitioned from the U.S. Fish and Wildlife Service to full-time administration by the Confederated Salish and Kootenai Tribes. Next, we're off to a different kind of refuge, a Montana guest ranch that draws people from around the world who are looking for a bit of respite. But most of these visitors never pack a suitcase and actually never set foot on Montana soil. Manure scooping is one of those mundane ranch tasks, typically done without an audience. But on any given day, there could be dozens of people watching Suzanne Miller from above. This is crazy, isn't it? 24 hours a day, seven days a week, including holidays. That's called our ranch camera. Suzanne invites guests around the world to watch the ranch's every day and once in a lifetime views from four bird's eye cameras. I mean, that's why you open a guest ranch, is you want to share what you have. You want to share that love. And here was a whole new way of doing it. We have to adjust this at just the right height so that it's the same position for the camera every day. If we don't, we hear about it. With help from tech wrangler James Wassum, the ranch has built an incredibly high-tech infrastructure. What started out as the ranch office for trail rides turned into command central for all the webcams. There's one camera catching all kinds of hungry airborne creatures snacking all hours of the day and night. The more reflective but equally active river cam showcases the Bitterroot River and its banks. And the ranch cam, centered on the corral, lets visitors watch horses and the humans who care for them. If one of us have left a gate open accidentally, uh, it takes about five minutes and we hear about it. Finally, there's the Osprey Cam, offering viewers an up-close view of Harriet the Osprey and her mate Swoop and their annual brood of chicks. This is the camera where the whole idea took off. In 2011, scientists from the University of Montana approached the Miller family to install the camera to study bird behavior. By the following year, hundreds of thousands of viewers were watching. 
And to Suzanne's surprise, many of them were still watching the empty nest even after the osprey flew south. When I went to turn off the web camera at the end of the breeding season, I got scores of emails and phone calls from people saying, please don't do that. We want to watch your ranch because they could see behind the nest all of our activities, the horses coming and going, and they were fascinated by it. You know, at first I didn't get it. I thought, well, get a life. What do you mean you want to watch my ranch? I didn't understand it at all. Then Suzanne became gravely ill. She was homebound for six months, and for the first time, she tuned in to her own camera. Suddenly, I, I got it. That if you, know, if you were homebound for any reason, and your life is confined to four walls, wow, having a portal to a natural place where lots of fun things are happening, real things, real people that you can talk to, that's a whole different thing than watching TV. It's just a whole different thing. Nearly 2,000 miles away, as the raven flies, Diane Hoffman was drawn in from her own computer in Kennett Square, Pennsylvania. She had come for the osprey, but she stayed for the horses. I got pulled into a whole environment that was Western in which I could not, there's nothing like this on the East Coast. Grooming is a two-part process. As Suzanne added the other cameras, she set up a whole online community and called it Days at Dunrovin. Just working it in in small little circles. And now, outfitted with wireless microphones, there we go. they started a two-way conversation with their own online subscribers, inviting them to help name animals, control cameras, and listen in on live programs. I've got, in Montana fashion, a growler full of water. <laughs> if you are not able to be in Montana, this is the second best way to be there. I mean, you know, I can't think of anything the internet's done better for me than these cams. Like many of the online community members, Diane discovered the cameras during a lonely time in her life. She had lost her husband of many years, and in many ways, lost herself. And Dunroven Ranch opened her eyes to a new landscape of healing. It's a place where it's calm, nobody's fighting, and where people are nice to each other. And for me personally, it was a perfect place to rejoin the world, because that's what I think I did in Dunroven, as I came out of my dark place and I rejoined the world. Last year I got an email from a woman who said, I'd like to come and spread some of my mother's ashes at Dunrovin. Would you allow me to do that? And I wrote back and said, of course. She said that Dunrovin had been her mother's happy place for the last two years of her life. Technology is great, but it really doesn't have a purpose unless we're able to use it to connect and, and be more human with each other. Dunrovin's cameras provide that chance to truly connect with real Montana landscapes, animals, and people in situations that range from high thrills to no frills. I am sure that the people in Montana don't think they're as special as they are, and they don't think they're as unique as they are, and I don't think that they think they're any different, but they are. Hey. They really are. More than 200 paying members watch the cameras from places as far away as Eastern Europe Australia, and Japan. Meanwhile, Suzanne and James plan to keep expanding Dunrovin's digital offerings with additional live programs and more camera views. The National Bison Range is an open-air laboratory for bison research. The public can watch the yearly gatherings where the herd is inspected and treated. The Confederated Salish and Kootenai tribes have a long history of wildlife management on the reservation restoring habitat and establishing wetlands that are home to dozens of wild animals. Montana has a variety of markers that signal the changing of the seasons. One sure sign that winter has arrived is the formation of ice on our dozens of rivers. We followed the Clark Fork River in western Montana to observe this beautiful process. One of the things I, I love about winter in Missoula is, is watching the river and learning and seeing what kind of um, patterns and forms uh, might emerge. You first start to get formation of what's referred to as border ice, uh, which can sometimes be ice formation at the edges of the channel
So when you start to see the, the chunks of ice that are in the water, the, the technical term that we use when that first forms is called frazzle ice. After the border ice, you would start to get this frazzle ice formation where the, the river is still flowing and you have these um, ice chunks flowing downstream, but they're starting to get denser and denser in terms of how much of the surface of the water is flowing, moving water. When we have ice formation that is frozen to the bed of the river, we call that anchor ice. So you have the frazzle ice on the surface, the anchor ice on the bed, the anchor ice we don't see for the most part, and then periodically that anchor ice will, will break away and move up towards the surface and in some cases contribute to sort of the consolidation of the surface. But in a river like the Clark Fork, we would generally expect there to be some flowing water underneath the surface of the ice. It's a neat part of our rivers. It's an important part of our rivers in terms of thinking about connections to climate change and ecosystems. Important to understand, but also important to appreciate the, the wonder of it. It's extremely rare for rivers to freeze solid in Montana, and with varying degrees of thickness, experts remind us to use great caution when approaching any ice on the rivers. A careful drive through the National Bison Range on the Flathead Indian Reservation offers spectacular views of the Mission Mountains and close-up views of the namesake residents. Bison may look sleepy and slow, but they're strong, resilient animals. Tribal elder Shirley Trahan loves spending time here. Our families would come picnicking and uh, gazing at the buffalo. And also uh, another attraction was the white buffalo, big medicine. Now that was turned back over to the tribes, that means quite a bit to all of us to be able to come here and realize it's, it's home, it's, it always was. Makes my heart happy to be here, up here, especially, like you said, it's like the top of the world. <laughs> I, I really love it here. In our final story, we meet some community college retirees who have found the secret to happiness in the simplest of things, friendship, volunteering, and camping. Spring rains are drenching Lake Alva and its lonely campsites. However, some very important guests are about to arrive. I'm always amazed at the colors. Look at that. Retirees Tim Kelleher and his wife Sandra Pollock have been driving for five days. They make this trek every May, escaping the heat of Tucson for the cool of Montana's forests. We're here. Yay! <laughs> A little more this way. Tim and Sandra, and their dog Lily, have volunteered as camp hosts at Lake Alva for years. We are home. Feels good. Yeah, it, it is. It really it does. Is. It does. Eleven miles away and two weeks earlier, retirees Mike Tweeten and his wife Lisa Holtorf arrived at River Point Campground. Mike and Lisa have hosted here as long as Tim and Sandra have hosted Lake Alva. In fact, the four of them usually make the trip from Tucson to Sealy Lake together because they were friends well before they ever put down stakes here. The majority of us came from Pima College's downtown campus. It's a big, big community college. Sandra was a counselor, Tim a construction lab assistant, and Mike a biologist and entomologist. Out of these different backgrounds emerged a common bond, the great outdoors. We would plan weekends and end up all camping, like get five, six sites together, and it was just fun. So the four of us ended up uh, developing a really close friendship. 
As the four friends began to ponder retirement, they knew they wanted to stay active. We were daydreaming about what are we going to do when we retire. We've always talked about camp hosting, and so I started looking at volunteer.gov. We were still just talking and thinking. It's like, should we do it or should we not? Then fate nudged them into action. Tim had a health scare, and that was really a push to say, you know what? Life is zipping by. It is time to do this if we're going to do this. Neither couple had seen their campgrounds before they arrived. It was love at first sight. It takes my breath away. It's just gorgeous. You know, I'm not a religious man or anything like that, but it does help the soul just to be out in nature. I think we both fell in love with it as soon as we got here, the lake and the river and, and just everything about it. Couldn't ask for a better place. In fact, I've told a lot of campers, this is not only the best job in the world, but the best place in the world. It may look perfect, but the hosts have lots of work to do before the campers arrive. There are leaves and needles to be raked, fire pits to clean, and bathrooms to sanitize. And nobody seems to love the work more than Tim. He's amazing. He should be the poster child for a camp host, I think. Tim's got the biggest heart in the world, always happy to help out everybody. Tim can't sit still. Hi guys, how you all doing? You don't want to grow old sitting in some chair. You just want to keep moving forward. Never stop, no matter what. You've grown a few inches, you cannot stay stationary. You get stationary, somebody's going to run you over. So beyond their normal hosting duties, Tim volunteered the four friends to paint all the speed bumps in the campgrounds. He also repainted Alva's old wooden map. If you see something broken or worn out, fix it. You know, I got all the time in the world. Tim's background as a combat engineer with the Army Rangers means he can fix just about anything. Each one is 120 voltage. Our whole purpose is to try and take any weight we can off the ranger. They do a lot, more than, more than what it says in the description. <laughs> ranger Eric Burt says campers take notice that these hosts are going the extra mile. It's nice to have them here. Uh, it's nice to have a little bit of, of authority running around. We were pulling in, it was all raked and clean, yeah. Visitors comment, even on small stuff like that to where you know, seeing the lines from a rake around a campsite, you know, it, it tells folks that they care and are keeping track of things. Tim and Sandra aren't just leaving their mark on the campground. They've sanded and refinished the bear cubs that welcome visitors to Seeley Lake. And Sandra volunteers at the Historical Society. Got to play the organ, dust the skeleton, make sure the grizzly bear furs are fluffed up and ready. So it's a blast. <laughs> Okay, that's good. <laughs> While Sandra plays the pump organ for visitors, her husband has found another job that needs doing, right outside the museum. Do something good for other people. That's where the real joy is. This year, they brought more friends from the college to share the joy. Ed Doran and Ken and Anne-Marie Bice threw their weight into volunteering. Every Sunday, the whole group got together for potlucks and pizza nights. <laughs> There is one very difficult part of the job, though, saying goodbye when the summer's over. It gets harder every year. It really does. It's a little bit bittersweet, but <laughs> knowing we'll be back makes it easier. If I drop dead right now, I'd be the happiest person in the world. Don't need nothing. Got everything. Got a good wife, great dog, grandkids, kids. We got friends out here in the woods. What else do you need in life? That's it, rolled up in a box. Tim and Sandra and Mike and Lisa hope to recruit more of their colleagues to volunteer as camp hosts with them next spring. They figure if they've learned the secret to happiness, why not share it with others? We're happy to share our show with you today. 
We'd like to thank the Confederated Salish and Kootenai Tribes and the staff at the National Bison Range for their help. The National Bison Range is open during daylight hours only, weather and road conditions permitting. Closing times vary seasonally and will be posted. Report to the Visitor Center when you arrive. So many of our stories have been suggested by viewers just like you. Leave a story idea on our Facebook page or write us at Backroads of Montana, the University of Montana, Missoula, Montana, 59812. You can watch previous episodes of our show at montanapbs.org or pick up a DVD at your local library. And with this show, we've reached a milestone, or a mile marker, if you will, 50 episodes of the Backroads of Montana. Thank you for watching all these years. And if you keep watching, this show will keep covering the Backroads of Montana. I'm William Marcus. Thanks for coming along. Backroads of Montana is made possible with production support from the Greater Montana Foundation, encouraging communication on issues, trends, and values of importance to Montanans. The Big Sky Film Grant and the University of Montana. From mountain peaks to prairie lands, the places I have known. And I'm bound to ramble. Yes, I'm bound to roam, and when I'm in off the road now, boys, Montana is my home. Coming in off the road now, boys, you know I'm heading home. Programming on Montana PBS is made possible in part by viewers like you, the friends of Montana PBS. Thank you. And by Montana Public Radio, Montana national and international news and analysis on the air every day. With blues, classical, jazz, and more, we have music day and night, news you can trust, and hand-picked music on listener-supported Montana Public Radio.